everyone, I'm back and this week I'm going to be discussing the medical school application process. It's very exciting. I'm going to chronologically go through the different hurdles that you may face whilst applying for medicine at Oxford. GCSEs. The first hurdle you're probably going to approach is your GCSEs or which I'm sure most of you have already completed them. This is because Oxford uses a form of logarithm that takes into account the number and percentage of a stars that you have in order to figure out who to invite to interview. But this doesn't mean that you can't get in with fewer, as Oxford takes into account your school's GCSE performance, as well as any extenuating circumstances that you may have had during your GCSEs. Personal statements. Your personal statement isn't actually something which makes up the process of deciding who to invite for interviews, but it is of course something that you'll have to do before sending your application. Firstly, it's unlikely that your personal statement is going to be all that different from every other medical school applicant in terms of putting information about work experience, extracurricular activities, ways that you deal with stress, etc. Although this is more for the benefit of the other medical schools that you'll be applying to. In order to optimise it towards Oxford, it's generally considered to put some form of academic interest into your PS. So this can take the form of highlights in books that you've read, or articles, or even any research that you may have already conducted, which would be particularly impressive. It's important to make sure that you actually read things you're interested in. So everyone usually advises to read The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, but personally, I hated it. and. On my PS, I had that I read Genome, Conversations with Neil's Brain, and some unbelievably boring immunology textbook, which I wish I'd never put down. BMATS. The next big hurdle, which will be taken after you've applied, is the BMATS. Everyone always seems ridiculously scared of this exam, but really, it's not that bad. The reason it's so scary is that you sit it after you've applied. And the fact that, along with your GCSEs, your score on this is what will determine whether you actually get an interview place. It's a two hour exam and it's split into three parts. So the first part is based on measuring your aptitude and reasoning skills, which really isn't that dissimilar from the UK CAT, which is an exam which I'm sure most of you will be taking to apply to other medical schools within the UK. Thus there are some cross transferable skills that you can apply here that you have learnt in preparation Otherwise, this section really isn't that scary and isn't particularly easy to advise for either, considering it's just judging your reasoning. The part which most people spend their time advising for in a BMAT is the second part, which is based on scientific knowledge. The theory required to do well in this part really isn't that much higher than general GCC standard, but if you haven't continued to study all the sciences and maths in your education, then you should definitely make sure you review these. For example, I had forgotten nearly all of my physics work, completely. So in the end, I ended up reading an A-level physics textbook, which was actually completely futile because VMUT just doesn't approach such advanced levels of knowledge. What really was useful was making a list of all the different equations that I'd need to know from the different GCC syllabi. As well as that, the VMAT actually have a specification on their website which I went through and ticked off once I was sure that I knew everything in each section, which is really helpful. The final part of BMAT is the essay. This takes the form of one page, which seems like a tiny amount, but really, it's quality over quantity. I know people who wrote half a page in their final essay and got full marks for it. You really need to make sure that you have a focused answer to a question that doesn't go too off topic, because otherwise your points are massively reduced. Also they evaluate your use of English with a grade. Nearly everybody gets an A so I wouldn't be too concerned. Although somehow I managed to get a C. But luckily Oxford really doesn't care so much about your score of the essay. They're really interested in your score on the first two sections of the BMAT. In terms of what I used to revise, I bought the 400 question BMAT book which everyone seems to have. It's reasonably useful Although you really shouldn't expect the questions within the book to emulate the questions in the exam in terms of difficulty. 
Although really, the hardest part of a BMAT and where most people slip up is in terms of timing. Many people don't actually get around to answering all the questions. So you really need to take an approach where you understand how long you should be spending on each question in the exam. And if you've reached that time limit on a certain question, then make an educated guess and move on. And perhaps come back to it at the end. You don't want to waste time. It also means you need to try and be as calm as possible, which is indeed difficult, but you'll definitely be wasting time if you're panicking too much. Interview preparation. So now assume that you've got an interview at Oxford, you're obviously going to be concerned about how much preparation you should do. Really, there's no point in constantly reviewing all of your A-level textbooks or trying to go even more advanced than that. Because your interviews really aren't here to ascertain how much knowledge you have about the subject. They're here to see how you think and whether you'll flourish in the tutorial system that we have. Obviously make sure you read any books that you put in your personal statements and that you can explain the general theme of the book and perhaps a particular area which you found interesting. Other than that, I wouldn't go particularly overboard in trying to learn science. I would, however, advise that you scratch up on your knowledge of ethics. I did this rather easily by just using the GMC's Good Medical Practice in Action Interactive Case Studies, which you can find online, and are a really easy and quite fun way to pick up typical ethical situations which you might be asked about during your interviews. Finally, in terms of preparation, it's rare, but some interviews may indeed ask you to, say, prepare a five-minute presentation. Don't be too worried about this, it's going to make up a tiny part of your actual interview, but it's really just to gain some insight into what interests you and perhaps how you approach the research by yourself. But I'm not going to expect it to be perfect by any means. The interviews. So in terms of the actual interviews, you'll be allocated to two separate colleges, one of which would usually be the college you apply to. At each college, you will have two interviews, typically. Sometimes you might have three, depending on what college you're interviewed by. Often expected that one interview will be science-based and one will be ethics-based. But really, this doesn't necessarily happen in practice. Often it's a mishmash of both. Firstly, it's obviously important to follow all the typical advice regarding Oxford interviews in terms of being relaxed, rested, having eaten, etc. before going into your interview. As although they're only say 20 minutes long, they are indeed pretty intense. Initially, interviewers will often ease you into a discussion, although that may not be obvious from your viewpoint. Considering this can take the form of just small questions and tasks, or, for example, in one of my interviews, I was asked loads of questions about mirrors, which was A, to get me talking, and B, to throw me off with any pre-prepared speeches that I may have, so that we could focus on the topics at hand that we're discussing. Following this, typically, there are set tasks, which can involve a whole range of things, such as reviewing graphs and trying to figure out what they're trying to show. It's really common to be given a picture of something or an actual object and trying to understand what it is. So for example, I was given a skeletal formula of a molecule and had to figure out what it was, which does indeed seem ridiculous and impossible if I don't just learn all the skeletal formula of molecules. But that really wasn't the point. The point was so that I could ask my tutor questions about it and for that to try and figure out what this may be that I'm looking at. So remember, you can ask an interviewer for hints or help in any form of problem solving that you may be doing in your interviews and are often more than happy to give it. Also, as I said earlier, you mustn't forget that you really want to see how you're thinking. So you need to make sure that you're thinking out loud. Otherwise, how are they going to have any idea? And another really important message to take home about interviews is that you're going to get unbelievable amounts of things wrong. Definitely. I personally got so much wrong and hadn't heard of so many things I brought up in my interviews that I told some people that I'd been rejected before I actually knew the decision. Which just goes to show how difficult it is to tell from the actual interview. So I hope that's given you a bit of insight into the process. There are loads more details about what Oxford are looking for on the Oxford Undergraduate Admissions site as well as the Oxford Medical Sciences Division page. But otherwise, if you have 
any more questions or information I haven't covered at all that you think I should, then cool. Bye.